I'm Ollie Alexander. I'm lead singer of the band Years and Years and an out gay man. Maxi, what's up? Hiya. Hiya. I've also recently come out about my struggles with my mental health. I have anxiety and depression and I'm not alone. There's a perception that in 2017, for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people, it's all good. We have equal marriage, we're protected in rights, but... The stats tell us that 40% of LGBT people are likely to suffer with mental health issues like anxiety and depression, compared to 25% of the general population. That's outrageous. And I feel like it's something we are just ignoring. It's something that I come across all the time from fans of years and years in letters, when I talk to them at shows. It's something I know about my own personal experience, but also my friends who are in the community. I personally have yet to meet an LGBT person that hasn't been unscathed by growing up LGBT. I, just, I mean, I haven't. I want to understand why and what impact growing up gay has had on me. There's a way to make an entrance. This is my destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. I've probably been aware of my depression and anxiety for about 12 years, but I often wonder where it came from and what caused it. I've always kept diaries, so they feel like a good place to begin. What I started to notice when I was reading about these diaries is how really early on, I start to feel really distressed and I don't tell anyone about it, I don't think. So I'm 14, turning 15. I think my parents have just split up and I'm starting to really have like long periods of feeling low and feeling people don't understand me and like feeling kind of just unhappy and confused by it. 2nd of October, 2005. The other night was the worst it's ever been. I need to remember this. I remember dancing, that was awesome, feeling consumed by such incredible energy. But I was so hot, so I took my shirt off, just my small black t-shirt left. Dancing, and then Matt came up to me and saw my plaster on my arm. And then came the words I've been waiting for ever since I began. You haven't been cutting yourself, have you? <sighs> Boy. I just wanted to do it because I, I felt like it was... I had all these feelings I couldn't deal with, so you know, harming myself was like, seemed the most obvious way to deal with it. It felt like simple and, you know, it felt good to do it. But then it felt awful and then it was just this cycle. And then a year later, I kind of stopped doing that and I developed an eating disorder, basically. Throwing up food and just constantly, constantly thinking about what I'm eating. Like, I just write in pages of, I will not eat bread, I will not eat cakes, I will not eat chocolate, I will not eat bread, I will not eat cakes, I will not eat chocolate. It's a really hard thing to talk about. <laughs> um, that's why I'm trying to talk about it. Um, we want to tell people that we're proud and that we're happy and that, look, being gay didn't make me sad, didn't make me, hasn't made things harder for me, it's made things better, it's made things great, look how, you know. And it can be hard to then go, actually, I think maybe growing up gay in, in a straight world <laughs> um, has really affected me and has made me feel all these things. And I think that can be a really hard thing for people to actually say. You know, I'm not saying that being gay means you're going to be sad or you're going to be depressed. I'm not saying that. But there's a link and I think I want to understand it better. My old room. I moved here with my mum and brother a few years after my parents split up and my dad moved away. This is it. 
This is my room from about 16. I feel a bit like it's like living in a cupboard under the stairs. I think 16-year-old me was very, very emotional. And I felt a bit like lonely because I didn't really tell, I wasn't really telling anybody about it. I also felt really like I was maybe a freak. <laughs> like I was really different because people were just telling me that I was different all the time, really. Part of me really liked being weird, liked being different, thought that was, that was who I was. But then this, another part of me thought it was, just wished I, I wished I was like everyone else, wished I was normal. Normal, my God, I can't believe I said I wish I was normal. <laughs> I don't wish I was normal. Yeah. I hate that word. I haven't seen Mum for a few months and she's been going through all our old home videos. Terrifying. Is that me? Yes. The next step live is so cool as all the songs. <laughs> well, it's the last Christmas of the 20th century and I'm so excited. Oh my god, I feel sick. I was bullied from when I was nine until I was about 15, but I didn't really tell anyone. I don't know if you knew, but in primary school, I started getting bullied. Well, I looked like a girl. They said I looked like really? a girl. Yeah, because I had long hair. And oh. then that became that I was gay. <laughs> and then in secondary school, yeah, I started to, like, think that I was gay. And then mm -hmm. that became... I just wish I was just like, I don't want to be gay. Like, I... It was too much. I already felt like... People picked on me and then I was like, this is going to be even worse. And then I think, I, I don't know, it seems like I was just like putting jazz hands over everything. I think about when you asked me, did I know that you were gay? Yeah. I said, you know, I had a feeling that you might be, but maybe I didn't want to um, affirm that because of fear. Mm. of what your life might become like from all the homophobia that still exists out there. So the bullying... When I was like 14, 15, it kind of stopped. And then he s yeah, started 14, becoming yeah. anorexic, bulimic. Was bulimic, really, and then having... I was restricting food as well. And I would self-harm. <sighs> I remember thinking, why is this happening? I don't think we really had a, a full conversation at that. Three. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I, I guess I think I, I might have been in denial, maybe, or... I felt so bad because I couldn't explain to you what was going on, and I felt ashamed of myself for, like, being the way I was, and I couldn't tell you, and, and like... Could anything have been different if you'd been able to talk to me? I can't help but feel guilty as a parent. What could I have... Oh. You couldn't have done it. There was nothing you could have done. You would... I couldn't talk about it. No. I wasn't couldn't come to terms with myself at all with anything. You're a great mum. You are a great mum. You cannot underestimate shame. The moment it kind of creeps into your life from a really young age, for LGBT people, the moment that you realise that you're different to everybody else, that just plants the seed of toxic pain and it just grows and grows and grows and then it just gets larger and larger as you grow older and I think that has a huge impact. I left school 10 years ago now and I doubt the effects will ever leave me. 
I'd hoped things had changed, but a brand new study by Stonewall shows that half of all LGBT teens are bullied at school. Today I'm meeting a young guy called Connor, he's just turned 15, um, he's gay, and he was bullied out of his school. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Connor. Hi, Ollie. How are you doing? Good, thanks. And you're on the school? Usual. Just boring. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, school's you? definitely not changed that much then. When did you come out at school? 13. Right. I feel like it's a really brave thing to come out as young, yeah. young as you did. <laughs> um, how bad did the bullying get? At one point, a group of girls had spread a rumour that I'd said I'd done stuff with an older boy, and the boy found me the next day, grabbed me by the throat at the top of a set of stairs and pushed me down them. Wow. Mum phoned the school, had a go at them, and I think the next day or something, she had a meeting with the headmistress and told her, I'm le I'm, she's taken me out of school and she ain't bringing me back. You feel like... You're alone, you have no one to go to, you feel insecure about yourself, you feel like there is completely nothing you can do to change it. And people do targeting you for no apparent reason apart from you being you is just heartbreaking. At one point I was self-harming quite badly and I, I do still have scars from it. I was quite suicidal. I admit I did try to attempt it because I didn't think I deserved to be here anymore. I felt like I was to disgrace and I couldn't turn to anyone. Did you talk to your mum? No, I didn't talk to anyone. I pushed everyone that I was close to away from me. I think it's really, um, it's so hard to talk about, you know, thoughts of suicide. Yeah. Because I think it really scares people. It's a scary thing. It yeah, is, And yeah. it really scares people. Yeah. Um, it obviously, it's so, it's so good to talk about it. Yeah, it is, yeah because it relieves people from stress and thinking they're like alone and feeling that way and you can help other people get out of that state yeah. because you know what it's like being in there yourself. Connor isn't alone. Stonewall's study shows that two in three LGBT teens will have self-harmed and one in four, including 45% of trans pupils, will have attempted to take their own life. It's so awful to think that these young people can't imagine their bright futures whilst in the midst of being bullied. With his mum's support, Connor is doing so much better. She's found him a local LGBT youth group called Blah, where he gets to hang out with young people like him. Hi guys. Hi. This is Ollie. Hello. I think just goes to show like Connor was going through all this stuff and then it took him talking to his mum, leaving a school, but then finding a youth group for him to then start feeling more on top of things. Having youth groups and having places where young queer people can meet each other and share stories and like find support with each other is just so good. It's been so good for Connor. If I had the LGBT youth group, that would have been amazing. <laughs> For many of us, our introduction to other LGBT people is through going out on the gay scene, which is exactly what I did when I was 19. I moved to East London and I started going out a lot. And it was kind of this awakening in, in some ways because I was meeting all these people that I was so in awe of. They just seemed so self-possessed and colourful and vibrant and they were always at these clubs every weekend and I would go every weekend and I would get to know everybody and I started going out, I think, too much, like Thursday to Sunday to Monday every week. And now when I think back about it, I think for it to be really focused around partying, drugs and sex, it can really, I don't know, slip into a really damaging cycle and it can, I think, really, if you're already a vulnerable person, it can really just trap you and it's hard to find a way out. I am meeting a guy called Sean. Um, he's 25, he's from London, um, and he is going through struggles with drug use. 
Sean is fresh out of an intensive drugs program and I'm nervous to meet him as this issue feels close to home for me and many of my gay male friends. Hello! We finally Hi. get to meet! <laughs> it's nice to meet you! Oh, so awesome. I'm keen to break the ice with Sean, and dancing is always a good way to do it. Oh. Yes! Oh, no. Which? Oh! Wait, which leg is that? Right yeah. there. Right. You already did it! Uh. <laughs> Bring that down. Slide, slide, slide. Way. <laughs> I want to ask Sean what he thinks may have led to his addiction. When did you come out? I came out officially when I was 17. Okay. Um, I got forced out, really. My mum asked me one day, are you gay? And it took me a good 30 minutes before answering because it was kind of a big decision for me. So I told her the truth. It had a backlash. Fuck. She told me to go to my dad's. So she like basically chucked you out? Yeah, it was very hard. I took it very, like, rejection um, from my own mother. It wasn't eventually till my mum said, I'm not upset that you're gay. I still love you. You're my son. Um, I'm more scared that if there is a hell and the Bible says you're going to hell, you will be there and if I do go to heaven, I will be there. How would I live in peace in heaven? It was hard to be by myself. I had to learn everything by myself. Um, yeah. So it feels like, yeah, like loneliness and like isolation is something that like a lot of queer people experience. Yeah, exactly. And School was horrible. You tell someone a faggot, that straight away is like using the N-word, if I'm allowed to say that. It's, it's rude. That created a lot of friction and a lot of fights broke out, a lot of arguments. That's the blessing in the isolation, I guess. I can only say, it, from my experience, it pushed me into dark places. The whole culture of cruising, it, it felt so... Because it was secretive and I was secretive, it went hand in hand. No one asked my name, and then they didn't have to. I got what I wanted, they got what they wanted, went on separate ways. What do you think you were looking for, like, when you, were, when you went cruising? Acceptance. Someone to love me. Um, I didn't get much anywhere else. Then, as soon as I hit 18, I started sex clubs and saunas, dark rooms. Did you feel like I went too far, like, on occasions? Yeah. I slipped into typical gay drugs. I began with MDMA, and then um, meeting one person, they helped me into what the gay community called slamming. And slamming is when you inject yourself. And I was injecting crystal meth. I would be around people who would give it to me, and I would give them my body. Unfortunately, the hard lesson had to come from it. And unfortunately, I was um, drugged and raped. Um, and through that, I got given hepatitis C. Now, I'm still on treatment now for it. I fully can't remember the, the rape. I just remember waking up and crawling back home. I'll be honest, after the rape, I didn't stop. I craved more. I craved, I felt dirty, so I, I had to be in the dirty area. In my head, that darkness was my friend. When rejection comes at you from all these different sides and you're, you're, all you want is you're seeking connection and intimacy, if you even get a shred of acceptance from, from anybody, from anything, like, like maybe Sean got when he first went cruising or he got when he first went to a party, you know, like that is all you have to cling to. So of course that's just gonna reinforce itself. I know that when I was first sort of going out in the gay scene in East London, it was just a given that you would do drugs. You know, it went hand in hand with like partying, celebrating and dancing and that, that's kind of, you know, the positive side of, of, of gay nightlife. But then 
is so easily tipped into, tips into really damaging behaviour.